Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are the radiance of the Eternal Father. You enlightened the world with your divine teachings and filled it with knowledge through the simplicity of your apostles. May he us worthy to praise you as we celebrate the feast of your chosen apostles, Peter and Paul. By their witness, may we come to understand your hidden mysteries and keep your life-giving commandments so that we may be made worthy to share in their happiness. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and your children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father most holy, who sent his only begotten Son for our salvation, and to the glorious Son who chose Peter and Paul and filled them with wisdom and with holiness and sent them out to preach and to the spirit of holiness who strengthened and supported them in their apostolic mission. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. <coughs> o Christ, our God, you are sent to us by the Father. You are the High Priest who we profess as the merciful and forgiving one. <coughs> you, cho <coughs> you, cho <coughs> you chose your twelve apostles and by your spirit of holiness made them wise. You who sent them to proclaim the gospel of life and salvation. You honored Peter and Paul, two of your chosen apostles and true witnesses. Peter and Paul are two temples, and in them dwells the Spirit of God, the Word who became flesh. <coughs> Peter and Paul are two jewels adorning the crown of the Holy Church, the Bride of Christ. Peter and Paul are two strong pillars upon which the Holy Church has been built. Now, O Lord, we ask you through their intercession and with the fragrance of this incense <clears throat> to look upon us with the eyes of mercy and not to forsake us who implore you. Strengthen the weak, Heal the sick and satisfy the hungry. Bring back those who are far and protect those who are near. Forgive sinners, accept those who repent and pardon our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest. May we who worship you be united with your chosen apostles Peter and Paul, along with them, your mother, the Virgin Mary, and with the choirs of prophets, apostles, and martyrs. You are good and compassionate, and we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
apostles Peter and Paul as we celebrate your feast. We ask you to raise in your own hands the fragrance of this incense which we have offered, that it may be a sweet fragrance and a pleasing sacrifice. Through your intercession, may God forgive all our sins and favorably be mindful of all the children of the Holy Church, now and forever. From the mountains, the apostles preach good news, offer praise to the Lord God. May he help us through their prayers. On the rock of St. Peter, Jesus built his holy church. He completed her structure through the Reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all enriching all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. But not everyone has heeded the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what was heard from us? Thus faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Certainly they did, for their voice has gone forth to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did not Israel understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation with a senseless nation. 
I will make you angry. Then Isaiah speaks boldly and says, I was found by those who were not seeking me. I revealed myself to those who were not asking for me. But regarding Israel, he says, all day long, I stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contentious people. Praise be to God always. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against her. proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls we offer this incense and ask for your mercy O Lord From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaim life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle Matthew writes, And when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Whom do men say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then, he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. This is the truth, peace be with you.
Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It seems strange that our Lord should give an order to the apostles who are supposed to announce him not to tell anyone that he's the Christ. I don't know if that struck you or not in the gospel, but it seems rather unusual. Don't tell anyone who I am. After he's just asked the profession of faith, who do you say that I am? It's a very interesting thing because in this gospel, chapter 16, we're halfway through the gospel of St. Matthew, a little more than halfway. And the profession of Peter's faith in our Lord, you are the Christ, it is an act of faith. And recalling to mind, remember, faith is the illumination by grace of the human spirit that touches the will to respond to the grace and making that ascent disposes the soul to God's speaking, God's revelation. That's a simple understanding of faith. It's not a feeling, it's not a sentiment, it's not an emotion. Though sentiments and emotions may be involved, it's not faith, it's not emotions and sentiment. It is illumination of the mind, the strengthening of the will to respond to that grace and to be open and disposed to God's revelation. So St. Peter, what he's doing here, our Lord makes it very clear, this is the theological act of faith. This is the faith, the supernatural faith, because he says flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven has given you this to know. Anyone who would have seen our Lord would have seen a man. And so when St. Peter gives this profession of faith, it is truly of supernatural revelation. Now this chapter 16 is really about our attitude, the individual's attitude to God, before God. The beginning of the chapter is the Pharisees and the scribes coming to our Lord and asking the rabbi for signs so that we can believe. And then the end of it is going to be Peter's reaction before our Lord and then what our Lord demands of those who wish to be students, who wish to be disciples of his. So in the beginning with the Pharisees, their demand of a sign, this is very much of an adolescent attitude to faith. I don't know about you, but I certainly prayed this way when I was 15 and 16. Ah, if you exist, you better show me something. If you exist, somehow you have to make this that I see something, that somehow there's a sign. It's very adolescent. But the Pharisees and the scribes come to our Lord, and our Lord says it's a perverse generation that seeks a sign. Because really what that's revealing is not about God. It's about the attitude of the person. I'll do what you tell me to do in these Ten Commandments as long as you continually prove yourself to me. So it's really not about God, it's about me. And this becomes the big issue of the whole chapter. What is faith? You know, I gave the example last night of when Teresa of Lisieux was dying of tuberculosis. She mentions, she says that she understands why suicide is attractive. She was in so much pain. But she said because of her faith, she knew that it was a mortal sin. She knew it was not choosable. When you talk about emotion and sentiment, that's emotion and sentiment. And the faith overrides emotions and feelings because the, the, the faith is a disposition to God's revelation. Emotions and sentiment drag us anywhere, continually. So when the Pharisees come and demand a sign, they're demanding something about themselves, not about God. St. Augustine would say, just look around you. Everything is a sign of God. Everything that exists shows God's presence. And then our Lord tells them precisely this is about attitudes. He calls them a perverse generation. And later on, in the, later in the chapter, he then says to the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. 
Leaven, the yeast, the things you put in to raise your cakes, your breads, and all of this, these things that you put in. The leaven is the very interior thing that gives it that vitality, we could say, that raises it up. And so our Lord is using that image to speak about the intentions of what actually is going on in the scribes and the Pharisees. So we know it's about attitude and we know that it's about the question of supernatural faith. And supernatural faith is not easy. The lesson and example of St. Teresa of Lisieux, and I highly recommend, there is a book called The Passion of Teresa of Lisieux, written by Monsignor Guy Gaucher in French. It looks like Guy Goucher. Guy, G-U-I. And then his last name is G-A-U-C-H-E-R. Gaucher. Goucher. And he covers really just the last eight months of Teresa's life as she's dying of tuberculosis. Hence the title, The Passion of Teresa of Vesieux. You want to know why this woman was so great? Read that book. Then you'll see. Forget about the roses part. That's all very sweet. The roses are nice, but that's not the essence of her holiness. The essence of her holiness is you see in the flourishing of those last months of that last year of her life. So our Lord says, beware of these attitudes. They kill. They destroy. And then they arrive at Caesarea Philippi. And there where our Lord says, all right, so what do men say the Son of Man is? Let's talk about this attitude before God. And that's the gospel you have today. And then our Lord looks at the apostles. First he says, what do men say? And then he looks at them and he says, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And that's Peter's response. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. It's a supernatural action of faith. Now, Peter is a wonderful character because throughout the Gospels, we see him. He has all the frailties of human nature. He's us. At times, he's impetuous. He does things without thinking. He responds with, a lot of times, great emotion and oftentimes with great confusion. I don't know what you're actually saying. That's us. That's our faith. That's our life, the way that we live it. Why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to me? Why is this happening to me? Why is this going on? We ask those questions, and there's nothing wrong with those questions. But the problem is, is the questioning often leads us down paths which are not the will of God, which are not beneficial to us. And so Peter is very much us. And our Lord immediately, this is why we know that it's a supernatural act of faith, because our Lord says, you haven't received this from nature. This is from my Father who's in heaven. And then he goes on to identify the very name he gave Peter, Kepha. Remember St. John in his gospel wants us to understand that it is our Lord himself who names Simon Boulder, Rock. There are only three names in the New Testament that are given, that are changes. We have the two names that are given from heaven themselves directly, Yohanan, John the Baptist, Yeshua, the name of our divine Lord. And when our Lord meets Simon, he says, we will call you Kepha from now on. We will call you Rock, this change of name. So I don't know if you've noticed that detail. You can read Mark and Matthew and Luke, and you have Simon, Simon Peter, Peter written down. And the people who heard this gospel would know that name. They already have the faith. But St. John, when he writes decades later, he wants us to understand this name was given by the Christ himself to Simon this change of name. And this change of name is a change in vocation, the change of nature, the change of the thing that he is meant to be as a disciple of God, as a disciple of Christ. And that transformation is central. That's why St. John, writing decades later as an old man, he wants the Christians to understand that origin. And so we see it here in St. Luke. 
not St. John, but in St. Luke, we see this identification between that faith that our Lord comes to bring upon the earth and the change in this man's name. So that the sentence essentially says, and therefore I say to you, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against it. I don't know why we use in the red books the word Hades, that's Greek. Our word is Sheol. Sheol in the Hebrew refers to the grave, it refers to death, it refers to the tomb, it refers to, to the afterworld, and it refers to damnation, everything. Everything after that's just bad, that's a Sheol. But you'll notice here that our Lord says that the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against the church. Gates are defensive mechanisms. They're not offensive, they're defensive. Now you thought of this before. You know, in the Psalms and in the Old Testament, you talk about the gates of a city. The strength of the gates of the city is the protection of the city itself. If you read the book of Revelation, the 12 gates of the city of the New Jerusalem are the 12 apostles. So when you actually read this term, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it's often interpreted, and surely you've read someplace or heard someplace, it's saying, well, hell will never be able to overcome the church and shall always be here. But that's not what the text actually says. <clears throat> it doesn't say that the gates of the church will prevail against the shale. It says that the gates of shale shall not prevail against the church. In other words, the very church herself is on the offensive to bring this faith and to bring this salvation to the world. And smashing against the walls of shale, smashing against the walls of death and destruction and infidelity and hell and destruction and damnation will not prevail. The church will be victorious so long as the rock of the faith is what animates you and not the leaven of the Pharisees. This is a very powerful text. This is not just to be read by Catholics to say, see, therefore there's a pope. This text is about the very vitality of what the kingdom of God on earth is, which is an offensive mechanism to overturn death and infidelity and disbelief. And those gates protecting Sheol, the devil protecting himself, the devil protecting and death protecting itself, will not prevail against this offensive of the onslaught of the kingdom of God. That's what this means. It is an extraordinary text. And then at the end he says, don't tell anybody about this. It's an amazing thing. But when you read this whole text, St. Peter, when our Lord then immediately announces we go to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, hell is Sheol is going to show itself. And the Son of Man, the Christ, is going to be betrayed and spit and scourged and beaten. And Simon just doesn't get it. He's us. God tells us very clearly what we have to do in our life and we're like, no, no, it's not really that. Surely it's got to be this way. And then we start going off. And then I do a novena to prove that it really is supposed to be this way. Instead of actually responding and receiving the light. And so Peter tells, Simon says to our Lord, this isn't going to happen to you. This is, that's disgraceful. And our Lord calls him Satan. And tells him to get behind me. You're a scandal to me because your thoughts are the thoughts of men and not of God. It's an extraordinary moment. He's just been promised that I will give you the keys of the kingdom. This is a messianic office. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the one who opens and no one can close, and the one who opens and no, excuse me, the one who opens and no one can close, and the one who closes and no one can open. The keys. And he says, I will give you this participation in this office, this messianic position. And Simon, like us, thinking, you know, life has been good. My prayers have really been, I, they feel good. I like the morning offerings. I love the Angelus. It just makes me feel nice. 
And then providence comes in and just bam. And we're like, well, it shouldn't be that way. This is Simon's response. This doesn't make any sense. Surely this is wrong. And our Lord says, you're satanic. You're satanic, which means adversary, satan, shatan. It's an adversary. You stand in adversarial position to me. And he tells him why? Because your thoughts are earthly. Your thoughts are of this world. Your thoughts are the thoughts of men and not of God. So therefore you are a scandal to me, trying to trip me up from what I have told you is my Father's will. It's extraordinary. And then the end of this chapter, our Lord just says very bluntly, he who wishes to be my disciple must take up his cross and follow me. Do what I do, which is going to Jerusalem to be betrayed and to be crucified and on the third day to rise again. So this is the problem with the thoughts of men is we don't actually listen. The thoughts of men, you hear part of it. It's like trying to teach little children, right? Or worse, trying to teach teenagers. They hear the first three words of the sentence like, yeah, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. We do exactly that same attitude with God. He is always trying to communicate with us. And we hear the first part of what God says, and then we're like, okay, I got it, got it. We know that attitude, we live that attitude. If we don't live it now, we certainly lived it when we were younger. We hear part, we think we understand all, and we plow through and commit really just disastrous choices often in our lives. That's the thoughts of men and not of God. So when you listen to Simon, Simon doesn't even hear. Our Lord finishes with hope. Yes, there'll be betrayal. Yes, they will be spit upon. Yes, the Son of Man will be scourged. And on the third day, he will rise again. He doesn't hear anything about the third day rising. I mean, he hears it. He has ears. But it doesn't register. This is the scandal of the scribes and the Pharisees at the beginning of the chapter. Show us a sign, prove something to me. You owe me something if you want me to be a believer. This is horrible. But this attitude is so fundamental to us as human beings. We do this. Even those who are profoundly faithful can do this at times in their lives. This is why our Lord says, if you wish to be a disciple, if you actually wish to learn from me, you have to take up your cross. And in St. Luke or St. Mark, he adds, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. So this is not one of the most extraordinary chapters in the New Testament because the entire essence of what it means to be Catholic is in this text. It is about death, yes. It is about resurrection, even more importantly. And it is about the offensive of the kingdom of God to bring life and salvation to all the world. And that death and the devil cannot withstand this if we are faithful. If we respond the ability to actually hear the voice of God and to root out, to reject that leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes, when we have that, then there is profound hope. We will be crucified though. We will find that crucifixion in our lives, but as Christians, we know there's a reason for the crucifixion. The pagans, they just squirm and get angry and fall into depression and become addicts of opioids and alcohol and all and sex and all the rest of it and porn. Because there isn't a reason for it, we just hurt. But our Lord says there's a reason for hurt if you're actually hearing the voice of God. And it's never going to be the full answer. The answer is resurrection, if you wish to be my disciple. So this is why we celebrate Saints Peter and Paul. These men, yes, they're martyrs of the church. Yes, they are pillars of the church. Yes, Peter has a completely unique position within the kingdom of God. But ultimately, it's because Simon is us. And we can learn so much from what's in the text and from what we also have from the traditions of Rome and his death 
but really just focusing on this aspect of what is the kingdom. And the reason then we've all finished with, why does he then say to them, don't tell anybody? Because at the time of our Lord, if you notice in the Gospels, our Lord never calls himself the Messiah until the time of his passion, when the priests of the temple put him under oath, are you actually the Christ? <clears throat> and there he answers yes. And they scream and they tear their garments and they say it's blasphemy and he's got to die because he answered their question. So they're not listening. But everyone else, except for the Samaritan woman and the apostles today in chapter 16 of St. Matthew, he never calls himself the Christ, the Messiah, because everyone in that generation had expectations which were falsified by political, especially political and military visions of the conquering of the Messiah. So they saw the Messiah as being a political figure which is exactly what he's not. He's not a Democrat, he's not a Republican. He's much more than that, obviously. But because everyone thought, oh, 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 Catholics have to be Republicans. Oh, 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 Catholics have to be socially aware and be Democrats. Our Lord says that's all false, all of it, all of it. And if you say Christ to someone, they're immediately going to think the thoughts of men and that will be destructive. So what does he call himself throughout the gospel? Bahonosho, the son of man, which only means a man. That's all it means in the Aramaic. So when a man comes, when a man be lifted up, when a man says, who do, who do, people, say, who do people say that a man is? That's the question today, the son of man. And so because of the thoughts of men, they will misunderstand. And if you say to them, whatever you say to them, no matter how correct it is, they will not understand because their thoughts are already formulated as the thoughts of men and they see me as being a political figure who's only come to smash up Romans, which all of it is wrong. So read this whole text of Matthew 16 and understand that we're told to carry our cross daily because the cross is real. St. Teresa of Lisieux becomes a great mystic because she's transfigured in those last months definitively through the tuberculosis, coughing up a cup of blood each day with the, with the destruction of her lungs taking place. It's not what makes her holy, but because she carries that cross daily Holiness flourishes and faith flourishes, no matter how much at the level of emotions suicide would be attractive. It's a very profound and very modern story, well worth knowing, St. Teresa of Lisieux. And so on this day, we ask for the intercession of Saints Peter and Paul, that our thoughts become the thoughts of God, that our faith become truly vital to understand, to hear the voice of God, and in that transformation to give us the perseverance to carry the cross so that we will crucify our own misconceptions, our illusions, our thoughts in this world that are not the thoughts of God, that they be crucified so that in that perseverance we too may follow in the footsteps of our divine Lord, imitating Saints Peter and Saint Paul, and by that way being part of the offensive onslaught of life and of salvation and of resurrection against a world which is permeated by shale. Its gates cannot withstand the faithful when the faithful are truly faithful. May their prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not today, unsubstantial of the Father, to the end of all things to me. For us men and for our salvation, we came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary. Amen. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the Lord and Lord of God, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and has a solid church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. the offerings of our ancestors. Now receive these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. We remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us. We recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the parishioners of St. Joseph. Be mindful also of all those who share with us today in this offering. The 
senses. Do you listen? <coughs> Alleluia. Continue with with an offer of Saint Peter, Chief of the Apostles, on page 774. 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Praise to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. Lord, we bow before you to receive your blessings and assistance, for we are weak, and you are the support and refuge of all. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O oh Lord, may the light of your face shine upon us, deliver us from every evil, and blot out all our transgressions, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, on the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you, and with voices of praise we cry out and we proclaim.
accept our intercessions and our prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect your sh our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord, and Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who are desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Paul, St. Peter, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Favor, remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers and sisters, teachers and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory O God the Father, you strengthen and you encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to receive our offering, so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be 
time on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are thine. Now and forever. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo il kuluchunna. Aham, all below. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to you to partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O oh Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive all their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. And we raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. That each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever. Again, we thank you, Lord. We raise glory to you for giving us your body to your living blood to drink. Lover of all people, have mercy on us. Can you bring the light to the Thank you.
We thank you, O Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us. We may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokurkunna. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your cross, and be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.